She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signals in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. It's Coffee and Crime Time. We haven't done a Coffee and Crime Time in so long and this is going to be a little bit of a strange one. This is a very important case and I wanted to get the word out as soon as possible. I really didn't even have time to create a new Coffee and Crime Time intro so it's probably going to be a replay because I just wanted to sit down and go through my hurried notes and get this to you guys as soon as I could because time is running out in this situation. First I want to have a quick word from our sponsor Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a streaming and video service that's dedicated to bringing the finest high quality documentaries to a global audience. This service is meant for active seekers of information who are determined to figure out how the world works and how we got to where we are. Audiences all over the world are voicing a demand for a greater selection of high quality programming based on the best insights of historians and scientists. And Magellan TV meets this demand by offering what they call television worth watching. Right now, Magellan TV is streaming over 2,000 documentaries acquired from the best filmmakers and documentary networks around the world. They're adding new shows every week to a program lineup that includes a wide range of specially curated playlists and featured movies and series. Now, Magellan TV offers three subscription plans based on what you're looking for. The best value is the annual plan, which is about $59.88. So you just pay that, you know, 60 bucks once and you're set for the year. Now that's under $5 a month, but you can also sign up for the quarterly plan, which is $19.97 for the quarter. But if you just want to try it out for a month, it's $6.99 for a month, which I promise you is a great value. As somebody who uses and watches Magellan TV on a daily basis, the content you're getting and the value that you're getting from that content is well worth you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, even more a month. I think that what they're giving is a great bargain. Now they do offer trial periods, a seven day trial, 14 day trial, but if you're a viewer of Stephanie Harlow and you use the link in my description box, you can get a whole month for free and figure out if it's something you'll like and you're not tied into anything, you can cancel any time after that month, but I don't think you're going to want to. So thank you so much to Magellan TV for sponsoring our videos, as always for supporting this channel, which talks about difficult things that YouTube often doesn't like to monetize or, you know, share with anybody else. Thank you so much to Magellan TV. Thank you so much to you guys for watching the sponsor. And let's talk about our case today, which is the case of Rodney Reed and Stacey Stites. Currently, as I am recording this video, Rodney Reed is scheduled to be executed in the state of Texas on November 20th. That's literally less than two weeks away. And usually I would say, well, if he did uh, what they said he did, then, you know, maybe that's what needs to happen. But in this case, there is just too much controversy, too many holes in the story to really say for certain, or even with a halfway certainty, that Rodney Reed is guilty or responsible for what happened to Stacy. Now, as I said, typically I would like to get all my information straight and get as many details as possible and put everything into a really clear and understandable timeline in order to give you guys the best content possible. But in this case, we are running out of time and the clock is ticking for Rodney. And this is a man's life. So I wanted to get this out there as soon as possible and give you guys all the evidence that I could find. And hopefully, if you think that there might be a chance that Rodney Reed is innocent, you can take certain actions to, uh, to help him out and hopefully make enough noise that he's at least granted another trial. This has been a very hot topic lately. We have a lot of celebrities getting involved, like Kim Kardashian and Oprah Winfrey. But I wanted to talk to you guys, like me, just a regular person who is interested in true crime, but is also interested in our justice system working for us and not against us. 
And I've gotten multiple requests for this case on Twitter and Instagram and email. People want me to cover it and, and you, you know, usually I'd like to take more time with it. But in this situation, I really don't have the time to take with it. I want to get it out there as soon as possible and hopefully give this guy a chance. So if you see me look down at my notes or I have to look something up to get more information, bear with me. But um, I was just not allowed to have as much time with this case as I, I would normally like. And I wasn't really able to like absorb as much information to be able to just, you know, say to you. I might have to check my notes, but I just think it's important to talk about it ASAP. So Rodney Reed was convicted of sexual assault and murder of 20-year-old Stacy Stites in April of 1996. Her body was found on the side of a remote road in central Texas. She was getting married to a man named Jimmy Fennell, and she was working extra shifts at a grocery store in order to help pay for the wedding, and that's where she was headed that morning. Now, police linked Reed to her case when semen found in her body matched his DNA. When he was questioned about this DNA match, Rodney said that he didn't even know Stacy, which wasn't the truth. He claims that he initially lied because he was afraid of being accused of her murder, but it only made things worse for him. He said, quote, it was the worst mistake I ever could have made. I denied everything. I didn't want to be incriminated, implicated, or anything in relation to her death. Now this is 1996 at Central Texas, Valstrap County to be specific, and um, at this time and place, there was still a lot of racism, racism in this area. So it wasn't common to see interracial couples. So according to Rodney, he and Stacy had a consensual sexual relationship. They just hid it from everybody because they didn't want to cause a scandal, essentially. Rodney met Stacy, according to him, in late October or early November of 1995, the year before she was found dead. But at the beginning of January 1996, Stacy met her fiancé Jimmy while she was at a festival that he was working security at. And it seemed that their relationship moved pretty quickly because within a few months they were living together in Giddings and engaged to be married. And when Stacy died, Jimmy Fennell was obviously one of the main suspects, and there's a couple of reasons for that. First, when somebody dies, they're always going to look at the people who are closest to them, so uh, usually a significant other, boyfriend, husband, what have you. And secondly, because Jimmy had a bit of a reputation for having a temper and being controlling in his relationships. So, I mean, keep in mind, Stacy allegedly met Rodney first, and they, they had a relationship of some kind. And then she later met Jimmy, and they were quickly engaged and living together. But she continued, according to Rodney, to see him. In fact, he said that they saw each other a couple of times a week. In fact, he said they saw each other, and they had sex just a day and a half before she was found dead. So according to Jimmy Finnell, the night before she was found dead on the side of the road, Stacy had gone to bed pretty early because she knew she had to be up to go to work for the early shift to the grocery store. Now he says that it was about eight o'clock, they took a shower together, and then afterwards they laid in bed and he rubbed her back while they talked about their upcoming wedding. And then she fell asleep. When she fell asleep, he stayed up to finish watching the news or to watch TV, and then he fell asleep shortly after her. So when she woke up in the morning, you know, around 2.45 to get ready for work. She had to leave by, you know, 3 or 3.15. He was still sleeping. He said he just assumed she left around 3 or 3.15 because that's when she would normally leave for work. And Stacy that morning was driving Jimmy's red pickup truck to work. Now there's a whole thing behind this. Apparently Stacy didn't have her own car, so sometimes she would use her mother's car and sometimes more rarely she would use Jimmy's truck but there had been some issues with her mother's car. And since the grocery store she worked at was over 35 miles away from where she lived with Jimmy, it wasn't really a reliable vehicle to be taking that far. So Jimmy said, you know, take my truck in the morning. And there was this whole thing where he was gonna bring her that morning to work and they had talked about it with her mother the night before. And by the way, her mother lives in the same apartment building in the apartment underneath them. So they had talked about it the, the day before that Jimmy was gonna bring Stacy to work and then pick her up after work because they had some errands to run for their wedding. But uh, allegedly, according to Jimmy, that night they decided that Stacy was just gonna take the truck to work and then Jimmy was going to ask Stacy's mom to drive him over to the grocery store later so that he could meet up with Stacy when she got off of work and then they could run their errands together. So, I mean, don't ask me why they thought that Stacy's mom's car wasn't reliable enough to drive that far in order to bring her, you know, to work 
or in order for Stacy to drive it to work, but they thought it was reliable enough that Stacy's mom would be able to drive Jimmy out the same distance to the same area later that day. Don't ask me these questions, but uh, that's what he said. Now at 5.23 a.m., a police officer named Paul Alexander happened to be driving by Ballstrop High School. So um, I guess he was doing his normal route, just driving around, and he saw this red pickup truck sitting in the parking lot at the high school. And obviously the high school's closed right now, so he's like, huh, I wonder what this truck's doing here in this parking lot, and he called in the plates. Now Stacy's mother would get a call from Stacy's work a little bit over an hour later saying that Stacy hadn't shown up that day for her shift and wondering if she was okay. And immediately Stacy's mother was worried and called Jimmy to see if maybe Stacy had stayed home that day. And as soon as Jimmy found out that Stacy hadn't made it to work, allegedly he got very worried and he uh, he put out an APB on his own plates. And remember he's a police officer. So he puts out an APB on his own plates and it doesn't take long before um, they put together that the truck sitting in this parking lot is Jimmy Finnell's truck. Now, once again, how these police officers from a neighboring town didn't know that it was Jimmy's truck, you know, they they worked with him, they, they knew him, and they didn't know it was Jimmy's truck or didn't put two and two together once they had run the plates and seen that it was a police officer's truck. I don't know. It's it's unclear, as, as are so many things with this case, unclear and unanswered. So now they know Stacy's missing, and the truck she was driving appears to just have been abandoned in this parking lot. And they begin to look for her. You know, they they go out in full force. They're looking for her. She's the, the fiancé of a fellow police officer, so they're, they're putting all their efforts into this. But it's not until about 3 p.m. that her body is found. And it's not found by a police officer. It's found by this other guy who was just walking through this field and picking wildflowers for his wife. But before Stacy's even discovered, they start looking at the truck, and they're, they're trying to find things. They're trying to get an indication of where she might be or what happened to her. So a police officer named Ed Salmella actually took the lead on this investigation, and he was the one who first went over to the truck. Now, right off the bat, Jimmy Fennell is a suspect. You know, they, they don't even know that Stacy's dead yet, but Jimmy Fennell is a suspect, and like I said, for the obvious reasons. And he's brought to the police station, and he's questioned, but after he's done being questioned, Ed Salmella brings him over to the truck, and he's like, hey, do you see anything that's off or missing or wrong about this truck? And Jimmy points out a couple of things. First of all, they find Stacy's earring in the truck. They find one of her shoes. They find the red apron that she wore um, to to work, you know, at the grocery store. They also find shards of, like plastic shards of a cup that she brought to work with her every morning, which she would put water or whatever in to, to drink on her way to work. On the center floor hump, so on the floor of the truck in the center, Ed Salmella saw what he thought was some sort of like white mucusy substance. And he, he indicated in his report that this substance was still wet. Additionally, on the passenger side floor of the truck, on the carpet there, there was some more of that white mucusy substance, but this substance appeared to be a little bit more dry than the substance on the center hump of the truck. Stacy's earring was also found on the passenger side floor. Jimmy noticed that the driver's seat was reclined pretty far back, and he said Stacy would never drive the car like that. He also noticed that the seat belt on the driver's side was still buckled. Lastly, I want to talk about one other thing that was found in that truck, and it was a belt, or a portion of a belt, and this was identified by Jimmy to be Stacy's belt. Okay, so Ed Salmella, according to his report, he's supposed to stay with this car the whole time, so he drives behind it as it's brought to the DPS service center, and the crime lab from Austin is supposed to be called in to have a look at it. So they call the crime lab from Austin, which is about, um, you know, 45 minutes away from, from Bellstrop County, and they're on their way in to, to take this car and, and look into it and see what they can find. But as he's waiting for the crime lab to get there, Officer Salmella gets a call saying that a body is found. And, you know, obviously he's thinking, is this Stacy's body? And he kind of has to confirm it. And as he's getting off the phone, the crime lab arrives and he's like, listen, um, you know, we just found this body. It might be related to the truck. And they're, they're like, well, can you figure that out before we look at the truck? Because that might help. And then he gets another call confirming that they do believe it is Stacy whose body was found. So both Salmella and the crime lab leave and go over to the site where Stacy's body is found, leaving the car at the center pretty much not 
not like supervised. Nobody's with it at this point. At the scene, Stacy's body was found wearing a black bra. She had pants on, but the zipper was broken and her underwear were clearly pushed to the side. Her white t-shirt was found thrown on some brush nearby. She was only wearing one shoe and the foot that didn't have a shoe was wearing a white sock and that sock was completely clean. So obviously that leads us to believe that she didn't walk herself there, that she was most likely carried there. Another piece of her belt was also found nearby. There was abrasions on her neck that matched the webbing of that belt. So clearly we have the, the, the weapon here. We have the murder weapon now, which is this belt that belonged to her. And a piece of it was found in the red truck and a piece of it was found at the scene by her body. There were also some sort of burns to the left side of her face. There was a cigarette burn on her arm and she had scratches on her body. But it was determined that some of these wounds were given to her post-mortem. So after she died, somebody put these wounds on her. There were also two beer cans found nearby, and these beer cans, they didn't have road dust on them. They weren't faded by the sun. They weren't covered up by leaves or brush or grass. So it was pretty clear that the, the presence of these cans was fairly new on the scene, that they hadn't been there for weeks or even days. They'd probably been there very recently. Now inside of Stacy, they found a male DNA. They also found DNA on one of the beer cans and there was three DNA profiles found on the beer cans. One belonged to Stacy herself. The other two we'll talk about in a moment. Now you would think that Stacy and Jimmy's apartment would be searched by the police. Obviously this was the last place she was seen before she died, but the police never did search Jimmy Finnell's apartment and they said that they didn't have probable cause to do that, which is absolutely bullshit because this is the last place that a woman who was murdered was last seen. You know, this is the last place she was seen alive. And furthermore, Jimmy had, up till then, been pretty cooperative with the police. He'd taken lie detector tests, he'd given his DNA, he had gone to the truck and pointed out things that he thought seemed off. So why wouldn't they have just asked him? And you know, he probably would have said yes. However, there's no record that Jimmy Finnell was ever asked if they could check his apartment and they never did check the apartment. Additionally, the red truck that Stacy was driving when she was murdered, apparently, it was returned back to Jimmy. And if you, you know, look at the official record, it says that the truck was returned to him four days later. However, in documentation provided by the state, it shows that Jimmy Finnell traded in that truck to a local dealership the day after his fiance was murdered. Now here's my question, because the crime lab left the truck where it was basically as soon as they got there and they went to the crime scene and this crime scene, um, it was being processed for quite a while. So what we have here is Stacy's body's found about 3 p.m. The, the crime lab leaves uh, the car and goes to her body. They probably get there around 5 p.m. They come and do their work and Stacy's body's removed from the scene and brought to the Austin morgue at about 8.55 p.m but she doesn't arrive at the Austin morgue until 11 p.m. Now, like I said, Austin is about 30 miles away and it would typically be about a 45 minute drive from where they were to the crime lab in Austin and it took them about two hours to get there. So I'll just say that, I'll just say that and I'll say wh where'd that other hour go, what happened? What happened to that other hour? So if we're being logical and we say that the crime lab left where the car was and went to Stacy's body and her body um, didn't arrive at the morgue until 11, the crime lab was probably there with her until her body was removed. So when did they have time to go and process evidence from the car? If Jimmy Finnell had it returned to him and was trading it in the very next day. Some might say, they probably didn't process the evidence from the car, allegedly. Maybe they didn't even look at anything. And that white mucusy substance that Ed Salmela saw, that was never tested. So what was it? Now, some people believe it was a bodily fluid of some kind, but some people believe that it was a mucus discharge, a mucus discharge that a body might secrete after death. And maybe Stacy never got into that truck alive. Maybe she was brought from wherever she was killed and put in that truck and driven somewhere where her body was dumped. And maybe she was laying on the passenger side of the floor. And that's when her body secreted this mucusy substance and got it on the middle hump and on the floor of the passenger side. Maybe that's why her earring was found down there as well. 
Maybe the mucousy substance was more dry on the carpet because that's where she'd been laying the entire drive. And when somebody took her out of the car and pulled her over, she'd moved, her body had moved and gotten more of the mucousy substance on the middle hump of the car. And that had been, you know, an hour or so later. So that's why it was still a little wet and the other stuff was dry. Some might say that, allegedly. Some might also say that it's suspicious that Jimmy Finnell would trade in this vehicle and get rid of it the day after his fiance was murdered. Now, obviously you're not gonna wanna drive around in this truck, but the very next day, aren't there other things to take care of before doing that? Uh, funeral arrangements, mourning, what have you. And you're not really worried about rushing right to the dealership and getting yourself a new truck. But according to the documentation, it was the very next day that Jimmy Finnell traded in that truck. The very next day. Why would the crime lab give the truck back to Jimmy so quickly? Now, I mean, if you remember the Scott Peterson case, um, when he was suspected of killing his wife, they held onto his vehicles forever, for, for so long to the point where he had to buy a new vehicle to drive around while they had his and Lacey's. So why, what prompted the police to return Jimmy's vehicle back to him so quickly? It's a good question. Now, Jimmy was given two polygraph tests and both times when he was asked if he was involved in the murder of his fiance, he said no, and he showed deception. And after that second uh, polygraph test, he lawyered up. Now, he was a suspect, like I said, for a little while, but eventually he was just removed from the suspect list because the police said, well, if he did this, how could he have gotten from the place where the truck was found at the high school back to his apartment in Giddings, which was like 35 miles away? He couldn't have walked or ran there fast enough. It would have taken eight, nine hours for him to walk there, probably five or six to run there. And by the time that Stacy's mom had gotten the call that she hadn't shown up for work, she called Jimmy right away to ask if Stacy was with him and he was home when she called. So he couldn't have been able to kill her, ditch the truck and then get home. Now, this is working on a couple of assumptions that aren't necessarily true. One, we're assuming that the time of death is correct. And they estimated her time of death as somewhere between 3.30 and 5 that morning. So we're assuming that's correct. We're also assuming that Jimmy was working completely alone. And these are assumptions that will be challenged as we learn more about this case. Now in 2016, a friend of Jimmy's named Curtis Davis came forward and he shed some doubt on Jimmy's timeline. The night before Stacy had been found dead, it turned out Jimmy had been helping coach a little league team with a friend of his. And after that, they went to the bar and they had a couple of beers. So he wasn't home with Stacy that evening at the time he said he was. So why did he lie about that? Additionally, a Giddings Sheriff's deputy also came forward earlier this year and he told a story about something that happened at Stacy's funeral that shocked him. Apparently he was standing by Jimmy as the casket's being lowered into the ground. Stacy, Jimmy's fiance, is being lowered into the ground, dead, in her casket, and Jimmy said something along the lines of, you got what you deserve, directing it to his dead fiance who's, who's being buried at this point. And this really struck this sheriff's deputy to the point where he cut off all communication with Jimmy. He didn't want to have anything to do with him, and he started to question whether or not Jimmy had been involved in this woman's death. He said he hadn't come forward sooner because his family lived in the area and he was afraid for them. He was afraid that there'd be some kind of retribution. Another police officer came forward and he testified that the relationship between Jimmy and Stacy hadn't been all sunshine and rainbows. He'd been at the couple's apartment one day before Stacy had died. Stacy went to the pool to go swimming and Jimmy was, you know, grilling out on, on the grill, making food. And Jimmy said something to this man that, that struck him as well. And he said that he had reason to believe Stacy was having sex or cheating on him with a black man. And he didn't call him a black man. He called him something much more horrific and terrible, but he, he, that's what he said. So he basically told this guy that he had knowledge that Stacy was having an affair with a black man. And there are other reports of people coming forward saying that Jimmy was quite the racist. And let's talk about David Hall for a moment. So David Hall was another police officer. He was a friend of Jimmy's and he also lived in the same apartment complex as Jimmy and Stacy. So David Hall has an alibi for the night of Stacy's murder. His wife, his wife, says that, that he was home with her. Um, but you know, th there may be some questions there as well. Considering that David Hall was one of the people 
that was seen drinking with Jimmy after the Little League game. In fact, Jimmy and David Hall had been coaching this Little League game together. Something else to note about David Hall is his DNA matched one of the profiles that was found on the beer can, which was found by Stacy's dead body. The other DNA profile belonged to a man named Ed Salmella, and we've already talked about Ed a little bit. He was actually the lead investigator on Stacy's disappearance when it first went down. He was the one that looked at the truck. He was the one who saw that white substance, put it in his report. He was the one who had brought Jimmy over to the truck to check it out. Now, about three months after Stacy's death, Ed Salmella is fired from the police department. Now, there's no record of why he was fired. They have never come out and said why he was fired, even though they've been asked. But three days after that, he allegedly took his own life. There's a lot of people that don't buy this story, and, and I can clearly see why. So... Ed, that morning, according to his brother, had gone to the laundromat, you know, pretty early in the morning, and he dropped off some clothes. He told the lady at the laundromat, I'll be back in an hour. Um, I'm going to Louisiana. I believe he was from Louisiana. He's going back to Louisiana because he doesn't have a job now, right? And he's going back there. He's going to meet up with a girl and do some gambling. So he tells the woman he's going to be back in an hour for his clothes. After this, he goes to the bank, and he withdraws about $600. The receipts for these withdrawals, as well as all of the money, was still in his truck, in the center console of his truck. But about 35 minutes after he took this money out of the bank, and you know, an hour or so after he told the laundromat lady, I'll be back to get these clothes and I'm going to Louisiana, he apparently goes to his apartment and takes a gun, puts it to his head, and, and pulls the trigger. Now, there's a couple things wrong with this. First of all, um, Ed Salmello was right-handed, and he was shot on the left side of his head. So that's not typical, but I guess it's possible. Additionally, the police had come in to his apartment after his death to investigate, and they'd removed the couch that he was sitting on, allegedly, and the carpets. And they told his family it was because they didn't want them to see these things and, you know, have to relive what happened to Ed. But maybe, some could argue, that they were taking evidence out of the scene and, and who knows what they did with it after that. So the person who discovered Ed's body was a man named Rocky Wardlow. So he was a Texas Ranger. And there's some things to mention about Rocky. Rocky was, like I said, a Texas Ranger. He was also Ed Salmela's roommate at the time. Apparently Rocky was going through a divorce, so he wasn't living at home and he you know, was crashing with Ed in the meantime. Rocky was also involved in the investigation of Stacy's death. Rocky also claimed that there was a suicide note found by Ed when he was found, and it said something about having issues with this girlfriend that nobody knew existed, and it was basically written off as, you know, a suicide, even though there was no gunpowder residue on Ed's hands. I also noticed on Ed's autopsy report in the special notes and instructions section at the bottom that um, Ranger Rocky Wardlow had accompanied Ed's body to the morgue and was, you know, present during his autopsy. Now, there's a couple things wrong with this, obviously. First of all, Rocky is roommates with Ed, so there's some conflict of interest there. Additionally, Rocky was also put on the investigation of what happened to Ed Salmella, which also leads some to believe that there's a little conflict of interest there. Additionally, and allegedly, there was an eyewitness who lived in the apartment building, the same apartment building as Ed and Rocky, that saw Rocky leaving the apartment after the gunshot was fired and before the police showed up. That's alleged, okay? Don't come for me, Texas Rangers. Now, I believe, if my information is correct, that this man, Ranger Lynn Rocky Wardlow, is currently the sheriff in Horseshoe Bay, Texas. Additionally, <laughs> David Hall, the man who is friends, a longtime friend with Jimmy Finnell, and whose DNA was found on one of the beer cans near Stacy's body, he is now a Calhoun County commissioner in Texas. So... That's interesting that, that both these men who seem to be somehow entangled into to both these cases, they've, they've gotten, you know, promotions and they're in higher positions of power. But um, let's, let's quickly unpack that. So we've got Ed Salmella, okay? His DNA is found on, on a beer can near Stacy's body. You've got David Hall. His DNA is found on a beer can near Stacy's body. And both of these men have, have connections to Jimmy Finnell. 
And then you have Ed, who suddenly decides to take his own life, even though he just dropped clothes off at the laundromat, taken money out of an ATM, and told the laundromat owner that he was going to go to Louisiana and meet up with a girlfriend and do some gambling. This is a man who was clearly, you know, not planning to to kill himself. Why would you take $600 out in cash and then and then kill yourself? But that's what they say he did. In my opinion, speculatively, let's say that Ed Salmella was involved in some sort of incident or situation with, let's say, David Hall and let's say Jimmy Finnell. Uh, he was involved with something that happened that they all kind of had an equal interest in keeping quiet. Now maybe Salmella has a crisis of conscience and if you ask people who knew him, even people who he had arrested or had run-ins with as a police officer, they'll say at his heart he was a good guy. He always was fair to people and he was he was one of the good ones. So maybe he had a crisis of conscience and he said to one or both of them, guys we, we gotta do something. You know we can't keep hiding whatever the situation was that we were involved in together. We, we can't keep hiding. We got to come clean. This isn't right. And maybe the others who were involved, however many there were, maybe they were like, we got to shut this guy up, right? It's possible. I mean, if you were like writing a book about it and you wanted to create something that made sense, that would work. Now the DNA that was found inside of her did belong to Rodney Reed. And it was said that this, this DNA must've been put inside of her 26 hours, within 26 hours before her death because the, the semen was intact, the heads and the tails were there. So that was how they kind of came upon the time of death. And like I said, we'll find in a minute that that's not necessarily true. So they arrest him and they're like, case closed. You know, this guy killed her and now he's gonna go to prison and then we're gonna kill him. And he really, I mean, there's a lot that goes into this and he really didn't get a fair trial. He told his public defenders that he knew Stacy, that he'd had a relationship with her. He had family and friends who came up and, you know, testified to that or at least told the public defenders, his attorneys, yeah, we've seen her before. She's been to our house. She's been to, you know, our mom's house, his brother, his sister, his cousins. They'd all seen, they'd all seen Rodney with Stacy. And they could all attest to the fact that they had had some kind of relationship. So what was his DNA doing inside of her? According to him, they'd had sex recently before she was found dead. And this was consensual sex and there was nothing going on here. So if not Rodney Reed, who, who killed Stacy? Well, Reed believes and his supporters believe, as do many others, that the actual person responsible for the death of Stacy was her own fiance, Jimmy Fennell. Rodney said that Stacy had told him she knew that this relationship wasn't right for her, her relationship with uh, Fennell. Was she just telling him this because she and Rodney had a thing and she wanted him to be reassured or was she really just not happy with the relationship with Jimmy Fennell? Now Stacy's own family claims this is all lies. She and Jimmy were happy. He loved her. She loved him. They were, they were excited about their wedding and they don't believe that Jimmy had anything to do with what happened to Stacy. But Jimmy Finales had his own run-ins with the law. He served 10 years in prison in 2008 for kidnapping and raping a woman at gunpoint. Apparently this had been some sort of domestic disturbance call he'd answered and he offered to give her a ride somewhere and he drove her to like this park or something and pulled her out of the car and held a gun to her head and he raped her. And then afterwards he told her that if you ever say anything to anyone or you ever tell anybody, I'll come back and I'll kill you. And this wasn't the only woman who allegedly had been a victim of Fennell's. So another woman claimed that she was sitting in her car when Officer Fennell approached and he basically asked her to get out and then he said he'd found drugs in her car and then he kind of took her off the road a little bit and he was like, if you give me what I want sexually, I won't arrest you. I won't, I won't keep these charges on you. The woman and her mother called the police to report this and they were told since this was a complaint of misconduct, the charges would be dropped, you know, against her. There weren't going to be any charges, but it doesn't appear that anything happened to Fennell after this. What this woman does say is that after she and her mother called the police to complain, Fennell drove by her house in his police car several times a night and basically stalked and harassed her. Another woman tells a similar story. So she got picked up by Fennell on a drug charge and he asked her, what would you do to get out of this charge or to get out of being arrested and then he proceeded to rape her. After this, he called her several times to ask her if she wanted to go out with him on, on dates. A man named Keith Tubbs has come forward with information about Fennell as well. Now he claims that he used to work with Fennell's new wife, a woman named Ada, at the Juvenile Justice Center in Williamson. 
Apparently at some point Jimmy had come in and grilled him about his wife's social behaviors asking if she was seeing anybody or if she was giving attention to men that she shouldn't be, you know, basically trying to see if his wife was cheating on him or flirting with other men. Allegedly Ada also came in at some point with bruises on her face because Jimmy had thrown a phone at her. Ada confessed to Tubbs that she was scared that her husband was jealous, had, you know, issues with control and could get violent. She was also concerned about Jimmy's involvement in the death of his previous fiance. And as I said, there's no way I could cover everything um, in, in the short amount of time that we have and you know get everything out there. I'm gonna put as many sources as possible for you in the description box for you, for you to look yourself. There's a documentary called uh, Rodney Reed versus the State or something. You can find it on YouTube. It's really, it's really good and has a lot of information in it, but I'm just gonna take through the internet really quick to make sure that I didn't forget anything. So let's talk about Arthur Snow. Now, Arthur Snow came forward this month and he was in prison with Jimmy Finnell. When Jimmy Finnell was serving his 10 year sentence, Arthur was in there for a forgery charge. And he was actually like the head of the Aryan Brotherhood in prison at this point and Fennell came to them looking for protection while in prison. And apparently, according to Snow, Fennell confessed to killing Stacy after finding out that she was sleeping with a black man. Once again, he did not use the term black man. He used another term that is despicable. But th that's what he did, and that's what he said, according to Snow, and, you know, he seemed very proud of it. According to the affidavit, Snow said, Jimmy was talking about his ex fiance with a lot of hatred and resentment. Jimmy said his fiance had been sleeping around with a black man behind his back. By the way Jimmy spoke about this experience, I could tell that it deeply angered him. Toward the end of the conversation, Jimmy said confidently, I had to kill my N loving fiance. Snow says he didn't come forward at the time for fear of being labeled a snitch, but after that he had grandkids and he started looking at the world differently and he let go of some of his prejudices. And this makes complete sense because if you're, you know, a pretty big guy in the Aryan Brotherhood and we could tell Snow was, you coming forward and giving testimony that exonerates a black man is going to put you in a pretty bad position with, with your fellow Aryan brothers. So, so I understand why he didn't come forward right away. And I think it says a lot that he is now. Let's talk about the time of death. So this time of death was, I guess, garnered from, you know, the autopsy, but it was also based heavily on Fennell's own timeline, which has been put into question since he said he was home with Stacy at a certain time, but he was seen by a couple other people not being at home with Stacy that night. So now the whole timeline is in question. So the state claimed that because there was only three intact spermatozoa recovered from Stacy, that meant she'd had sex no more than 24 to 26 hours prior. And then with Fennell's insistence that he was home with her that night, uh, it would seem that, you know, the only conclusion was that she'd had sex before she was killed. Prosecutors told the jury at Reed's initial trial, we know from the credible evidence that sperm doesn't hang around for days on end. We know from the credible evidence that tells you that the sperm got in the girl's body within 24 hours of when the evidence was collected, which is when on her way to work. So pretty much the state is saying that uh, she left the house or the apartment alive and at some point on her drive from the apartment to her job which would have been like about 35 minutes Rodney Reed had what chased her down in her truck while he was on foot and you know raped and killed her and then disposed of her body and then drove her truck to the high school parking lot and left it there without leaving any fingerprints by the way and it's not as if he wiped the truck down because fingerprints were found in the truck they belonged to Jimmy and to Stacy, the two people who owned and drove the truck. So that's not odd. But Rodney Reed's fingerprints weren't found anywhere on or in the vehicle. So how was he able to wipe off only his fingerprints, but leave everybody else's fingerprints there? And if he was so concerned about, you know, covering his tracks and maybe wearing gloves, why would he have been okay with leaving his DNA on her? or in her, or both, because there was a sample of DNA found on her chest as well, saliva. So, so that's strange. So the writer of this article for The Intercept said that they always found it suspicious because it was oddly specific, the timeline. Even back then, it sounded like junk science. 
Reed's trial lawyers failed to call their own experts, so in 2002, I asked a Texas medical examiner unconnected to the case to review the evidence, and he was uncomfortable with the state basing the timeline on sperm evidence, which he told me is never very precise. In the following years, a number of noted forensic pathologists have agreed that the state's conclusion lacked scientific support. Even the medical examiner who conducted Stites autopsy and had agreed with the state's truncated timeline at Reed's trial recanted his testimony in 2018. Both a state crime lab and private DNA lab walked back the testimony of their employees who had been witnesses at Reed's trial, noting that their assertions that the sperm had to be deposited close to Stite's time of death were not supported and were in error. So what does that mean? They had this time of death between 3 and 5 a.m. when she left the house, between when she left the house and when she arrived at work, because she never did arrive at work, but on her way to work, she was was murdered by Rodney Reed. But now we have the medical examiner who did her autopsy um, recanting his testimony last year. We also have several state and private DNA labs saying that the state's assertions that the sperm had to have been put there sometime in the last 24 to 26 hours was pretty much not proven and couldn't be proven and were an error. It says there's another glaring issue for the medical experts who have reviewed the case. The state's timeline for Stites' murder was off by hours. According to pathologist, changes to Stites' body at the time it was found demonstrated that she'd been killed before midnight and then dumped in the woods the following morning, meaning, by Fennell's own account, Stites died while she was at home alone with him. So the writer of this article says that after death, the blood no longer circulates and gravity causes it to pool under the skin in the lowest parts of the body, leading to dark patches that resemble bruising, known as post-mortem lividity. When Stites' body was found, she was lying face up, yet the front of her body showed clear signs of lividity on her face, right arm, and hand and chest. Since lividity takes at least four hours to set, the pathologists have agreed that this meant that Stites was killed and left in a position where she was slumped forward, one arm outstretched for at least four hours before her body was dumped. Okay, so it's found on her back when she's when she's found in off the side of the road. But but according to lividity, she would have been laying in a certain position other than that for several hours before she was found. And I'm going to get to my speculation in a moment, and I'm sure you guys are following along and are right with me. During the initial trial, prosecutors emphasized to the jury that Fennell's story was consistent with their theory of the crime. It's important to know that nobody could ever find anything inconsistent with what he told you. Nobody, said Lisa Tanner, a Texas assistant attorney general. But that's not true, right? Because as we know, in 2016, Curtis Davis recalled a conversation that he'd had with Fennell shortly after he was told that Stites was missing. According to Davis, on April 23, 1996, Fennell said that he'd stayed out drinking after Little League the night before and was not home with Stites as he'd claimed. Him and a couple of other police officers, I believe, had consumed a little bit of alcohol. I won't say they were drunk, because that's not what he said, but they had drank a few beers after practice. In a 2017 court hearing, Davis confirmed the story. Fennell refused to testify and instead offered a written declaration saying that if he was called to the stand, he would invoke his Fifth Amendment right and refuse to answer questions. He said he stood by his testimony at Reed's trial. So, you know, 2017 court hearing, um, Curtis Davis reinforces that he was told by Fennell that Fennell wasn't home the night before Stacy was found dead, that he was drinking at the bar after Little League practice. And instead of coming out and saying, no, that's a lie, or I wasn't talking about that night, or I never said that, Fennell um, invokes, you know, the Fifth Amendment and refuses to answer questions. Two months before Stacy died, Fennell and another officer initiated a pursuit of Mario Murillo, Mario Murillo, Murillo, a man named Mario, and in a civil complaint that was eventually settled, Marullo claimed that the two officers chased him and beat him up. Marullo said that Fennell held a gun to his head. The sheriff had to be called in to calm the situation. Now let me tell you a little bit about Rodney Reed. He's not, he's not a choir boy. He's not innocent. Um, the fact that they had DNA from him that was attached to a prior sexual assault definitely says something. But however, that prior sexual assault that he was accused of, he was acquitted of that in court. And um, Jimmy Fennell's 
sexual assault, he pled guilty and served 10 years for that. So I think that definitely says something that one man was acquitted of a crime and the other was convicted. Now the details of the alleged assault by Rodney on this, this other woman, it did not come into evidence at the guilt innocence portion of Reed's trial, but it was used against him during the punishment phase as a means to argue that he deserved the death penalty. Prosecutors brought in testimony from a handful of women who had been sexually assaulted. Even though at least two of them could not describe their attacker, the state claimed they were all Reed's victims. In one case, Reed had been prosecuted and acquitted. Another case was later dropped, and the others remained opened, but after Reed was convicted of Stites' murder, they were considered closed. Now, this is from the same article from The Intercept that I'm reading, and it says, Reading the punishment phase transcripts, it's clear that the women who had testified had been traumatized by terrifying sexual assaults, but what is also clear is that solving those crimes, each involving a white woman or girl, including a 12-year-old who had been assaulted in 1989, was not a priority for police. Instead of aggressively pursuing these cases, it appears that law enforcement had done little to solve them. Then, prosecutors came in and weaponized the women's stories in an effort to send a man to death, in part by playing up the dangerous and offensive stereotype of a black male predator out to hurt white women. So, I mean, this is an issue, and we can go on forever, and guys, you should look into it. There's, there's so much more, so, so much more that, that we can't even, you know, cover, and just so many things that I want to look into further, and I could have done a five-part video on this, honestly. There's so much, and it's it's cool because there's so many court documents that are available to the public that you can browse through, and it will, it will take you hours. I've already spent hours on this, but what we really need to um, what we what we really need to like end this this video with is a question: Am I saying that Rodney Reed is innocent of the murder of Stacy Stites? No, I, I would have no way of knowing that. That's not my job to, to prove whether he is or not or to judge and decide whether he is or not. But knowing what I know about his first trial, about uh, his public defenders, about what they didn't introduce to the jury, and about the blatant discrepancies in time of death, the way the crime scene was handled, the way the evidence was handled, he sure didn't get a fair trial the first time around. And nobody's saying, let him go, open the prison doors and let him run out free and, and never you know, do anything with him again. We're, what we want is for him to have a stay in his execution. We want him to be allowed to be kept alive at this point so that he can go on trial again. And all this new evidence that is clearly indisputable in some cases, can be examined by a jury of his peers. We have multiple witnesses who have come forward now saying that Finnell was aware of the affair between Rodney and Stacy. Multiple. We also have witnesses, somebody that Stacy used to work with, who Stacy told that she was in a relationship with with a black man. Um, so it's not as if you know nobody knew about this. It's not as if Rodney is completely lying about being involved with Stacy prior to her death it's more likely that that her fiance who may have had some issues with with racism found out about her going behind his back and on top of that with a black man and went into a fit of rage and feeling that he had a badge and that he was powerful and that he wasn't going to let her embarrass him or make him look bad he killed her most likely in my opinion, allegedly, don't come for me. This is just my theory. I'm not saying anybody's guilty or anybody did anything, but if, if, um, you know, they're now saying the time of death was more like around midnight, what I believe happened or could have happened if I was writing a book about this and was creating a story that made sense, I think that uh, Jimmy may have had a couple of beers at the bar with his police friends and they started talking about stuff and maybe talking about Stacy and maybe talking about, you know, her boyfriend, Rodney, and and Jimmy was getting pissed off, right? And maybe his police friends were like kinda, you know, joshing him and jabbing at him and making him feel stupid. So he went home, a little intoxicated and really pissed off, and uh, he killed her. He killed her at their apartment, which we'll never know if that's true because, you know, the police never went in there and collected evidence. But he killed her there, and then he put her someplace or put her in the truck to wait there until he was able to get in the truck and drive her away and dump her somewhere. 
and then he probably drove the truck to the high school, left it there so it wasn't too close to the body and it definitely wasn't too close to uh, their apartment and then he had somebody pick him up and bring him back. Maybe somebody who later was at the scene with him. Maybe somebody who helped him dispose of the body. Maybe somebody who left their DNA on beer cans by the body. Maybe somebody who put out a cigarette on Stacy's arm after she was dead. The fact that his apartment was never searched, the fact that his truck was given back to him the next day for it to be traded in and never heard from again, it's just, it's suspicious to say the least. To say the least, it would uh, indicate that Rodney Reed needs a new trial and all of this stuff has to be brought forward and all of this stuff has to be, um, you know, seen by a jury and Rodney needs an attorney who's going to allow his witnesses to come forward and say that they saw Stacy, that they knew he was with her, that they'd met her before. They didn't let that happen in the first trial because they thought it would make him look bad. And, and you know, I'm sure they did the best they could, whatever. Whatever. I'm, I'm so agitated about this whole thing. Like I said, we're not saying Rodney Reed is innocent, but we're saying that he might not be guilty. And if there is that, that smallest little slice of might not be guilty, it's going to be really hard to be okay with sending a man to his death. But apparently Texas is perfectly okay with doing that because all of the uh, appeals that have been filed and all the requests to hold back the execution so that they can you know, get more evidence or look at the evidence, they've pretty much just been rejected. Re Rejected. So it says since October 19th, Kim Kardashian, who's taken a full plunge into the criminal justice reform, has tweeted or retweeted about Reed's case nearly a dozen times to her 62 million followers. Mark Cuban, the billionaire entrepreneur and owner of the Dallas Mavericks, picked up on the case too, tweeting about it to his nearly a million followers. Musicians Rihanna, Meek Mill, and LL Cool J have also entered the Twitter fray. In early October, Dr. Phil McGraw devoted two days of his syndicated daytime talk show, Dr. Phil, to this case. And on Thursday, his television mentor, Oprah Winfrey, told CBS this morning that the state of Texas should at least pause on Reed's execution. At least. They all want someone to interview, perhaps Texas Governor Greg Abbott. It's hard to imagine anyone less inclined to be swayed by outside calls for mercy than Abbott. Abbott previously served as the state's attorney general and his office fought to uphold Reed's conviction. During his 12-year tenure as attorney general, the state executed 278 people, including at least one innocent man. As governor, he has only once intervened in a capital case since he took office in 2015. Texas has executed 47 people, including those with strong claims of innocence. To be fair, under Texas law, the governor has only the power to issue a temporary reprieve unless clemency is recommended by the Board of Pardons and Paroles. Issue a temporary reprieve, Abbott, right? Am I, am I wrong? Traditionally, then, it would be the courts that would have the greatest power to remedy the possibility of a wrongful conviction. Too often, however, the court declines to intervene, often in a way that betrays its affinity for upholding convictions seemingly at all costs. This has been particularly true in Reed's case. The court has repeatedly denied requests for DNA testing, including on the braided belt the state alleged was used to strangle Stites. Did you know... <laughs> that the belt, which allegedly was the murder weapon, has never been tested for DNA? Wh what? That's, that's crazy. If it was the murder weapon, the belt would almost certainly retain the genetic trace of her killer. But the court has balked, agreeing with the Attorney General's office that the evidence has been poorly stored or handled too many times to the extent that the evidence has been stored improperly. However, that is on the state, which has the responsibility for safekeeping evidence. So literally the state's like, yeah, you guys are right. We kind of didn't handle this evidence properly. And we put a man on death row with this improperly handled evidence. But now because we've improperly handled this evidence, evidence that might exonerate him can't be considered because of our failing, because of us sucking at our jobs. More importantly, the most likely people to have handled it, aside from Stacy's killer, are members of law enforcement, including prosecutors, whose DNA should be relatively easy to exclude. Truth. The court has also engaged in a willful blindness to the cumulative effect of the evidence pointing towards a wrongful conviction. 
Um, it says Reed's lawyer has worked for him for nearly 18 years, and in that time, he's worked with a team of lawyers that has routinely uncovered new witnesses and evidence that called Reed's conviction into question. To raise these issues, the lawyers have used what is known as writ of habeas corpus, a legal filing that raises constitutional violations to challenge a person's detention. They've filed exhaustive writs that the court has sat on at times for years. And as they've waited, the team has found additional evidence. When new information comes up, they've filed a supplement to the main writ. However, the Court of Criminal Appeals has considered each new supplement a brand new writ. Meaning that at least judging by years of ruling in the case, each time it has received new evidence from Beignet, the court has evaluated it in a vacuum, devoid of the overall effect that the collection of evidence has on Reed's conviction. Sometimes the court doesn't weigh in at all. It just denies an appeal without comment. It did this in Reed's case most recently on October 30th when it denied by postcard his request to withdraw the looming execution date. So, I mean, this is, this is obviously an issue, right? You can agree, not even knowing everything, that there's a lot of reasonable doubt here and you shouldn't execute a person if there's a lot of reasonable doubt that says he might not be guilty and you kind of want to put the right person in, in prison for that. So, if it's not him and it's anybody else, we should find that person, especially if that person is, you know, a former police officer who feels like they have a problem with women and like to exert their control over them using a badge or a gun or both, allegedly. Because Jimmy Finnell is walking free at this point. Um, he was, you know, released after nine and a half years in 2018, so he's a free man. And why is the state of Texas so insistent on just... <laughs> going through this execution on November 20th, instead of saying, all right, let's chill for a minute and you know, go back and give this case an overall look, right? Not look at evidence as it comes in, but take all of the evidence together that the Innocence Project and Rodney Reed's team have collected and presented to the court, take it all together and look at it cumulatively, all together, what does it mean? What does it say? Does it say that this guy is guilty? Or does it say it's possible somebody else could have been responsible for the death of Stacy. What does it say? Now, why Stacy's family is continuing to support Jimmy Finnell, I'm not quite sure. I have my own opinions and my own um, conspiracies about it, my own thoughts about it, but otherwise, I, I will keep that to myself for now. But this video has gone on long enough. I mean, we could keep going through these articles and reading them, and if you guys want to like it together on a live where I kind of go through the articles and we discuss what's happening with this case, you know, I, I could keep going. There's so, so much, but you have the basics now, and you can go and check out the links in the description box, check out the documentary, check out, um, you know, all the resources available, because there's a lot right now, because we're coming up on, on the date of his execution. There's a lot of stuff here right now that's happening people are talking about. You can check all that stuff out and make a decision for yourself whether you feel comfortable signing a petition that allows this man to have a, a, a fair trial. A fair trial to determine whether or not he should be killed for a crime that he potentially didn't commit. Thank you guys so much for being here. As always, check out the link in the description box if you want to try out Magellan TV. I, I love Magellan TV. It's awesome. The other day I watched this documentary on Magellan called Women on Death Row, and it was awesome. And I think it would, you know, if you watched it, it would give you a good idea of, you know, how, how bad death row is and what the mental state of these people who are sitting waiting to be executed is. I mean, additionally, we could get into how many people every year are wrongly convicted and put to death or are just sitting in prison uh, under you know false evidence or tampered evidence or incorrect evidence whatever what have you that's a whole another video but it's it's a real issue and if you're not aware of it you know definitely look into that yourself thank you so much for being here i'm sorry this was so um all over the place and unorganized usually i like to have everything kind of organized into timeline format and but I just really, I needed to get this out now. His execution's coming up. And I know personally I couldn't, you know, live with myself and my conscience knowing that I have, um, you know, a, a group of people here who are interested in true crime and who want to know about these things. And I didn't use that influence in order to possibly help somebody and save their life. Thank you guys so much for being here. Stay kind and stay beautiful. And I will see you next time. straight down and that river runs deep the mountains get steep and the voices getting too loud all these feelings are very it's looking like a cemetery they're going back from the grave calling out my name better say a hell maybe well you don't know how deep it goes until it's
quiero.